morning, church. We invite you to stand with us. We're going to begin our time of praise and worship together, asking the Lord to open the eyes of our hearts. Let's ask Him with one voice to give us spiritual eyes to see, to refresh us and renew us this morning. Sing this with us. Sing, open the eyes. Here we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. To see you high. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. Sing it again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. See you high. Sing it together. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Sing holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Sing it again. Declare that he's holy. Holy, 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 you are holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Sing it once more. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Good morning again, and welcome. We're glad you're here with us this morning. We invite you to be seated. We're going to have a video announcement time, and then we'll get back to our time of praise and worship together. Hey, New Braunfels Bible Church. This is Brian Peterson, one of your deacons here at the church. I wanted to share some announcements with you. So our Ascend Student Youth Ministries are back in action. They met this last Wednesday and it looked like a blast from the photos. Of course, with Gary Armstrong and the other youth group leaders, it's always a blast. So this summer, they're gonna be meeting every second and fourth Wednesday of each month from 7 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. If you have questions or you wanna get your youth from sixth grade to 12th grade, in Ascend Youth Ministries, feel free to reach out to Gary Armstrong. Also, ladies, there will be a ladies Bible study this summer, June and July. It's going to be Wednesdays, 10 a.m. till noon. For more information on that or how to get registered, please contact Mary Hine. June 21st. Guys, yes, that's our day. If you know that date, Father's Day, we're going to be having a child dedication. So if you have a child or children that you'd like to have dedicated, please contact the church office for more information. Lastly, options for life. 
You've been involved with the Baby Bottle campaign in the past. Well, this year, it's virtual. Real simple, if you'd like to give to the Baby Bottle campaign, go on their website, click Donate. It will give you a drop-down box option. You want to click Baby Bottle campaign. From there, you type in hundreds and thousands of dollars and hit Submit. It's pretty easy. Also, we are accepting baby diapers and baby wipes here at the church. We have a uh, baby cradle in the lobby where you can put those diapers and wipes. Or if you'd like to bring them during the week, bring them over to the church office. Thank you for allowing me to share these announcements with you. Be safe, stay healthy. We'll catch you later. Right, please stand with us. Scripture says we were once far away from God, but now have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sin. Sing this together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus alright grace and Sarah are going to lead our next verse. Follow them. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it out. Oh, precious is the flow. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Let's take a moment and thank Him for the blood of Jesus Christ, which Scripture clearly says cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It is not by our works that we are saved, but the shed blood of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. Thank Him for that. We thank You. For the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have the power to do what we were powerless to do. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and unrighteousness. Thank you that as believers in Jesus Christ, we stand before the Father without a fault 
because the Father looks at the blood of Jesus Christ and we are covered. We thank you for that wonderful truth that allows us to come before you into the throne room of grace and worship you freely as your sons and daughters. You are the only one we need. We bow all of us at your feet. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Sing this with us. You are the only one I need. that together again. You're the only one I need. invite you to be seated for this last song. Listen to uh, the invitation of our Lord Jesus. This is the, uh, the message rendering of uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, saying, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have 
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. behind your regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling What a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. Oh, he is Lord. Pray with me. We thank you, Father, for your wonderful invitation. Thank you that your arms are open wide. May our hearts be open to your embrace. We thank you for the invitation of Jesus Christ for an easy yoke and a light burden. We thank you that we are under your grace. We thank you that we are your sons and daughters by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful unfathomable power of the blood of Christ to cleanse us, to free us, to pay for our sin. We desire to, to live as a people of dependence. We desire to walk with you in daily fellowship. Draw us near to your heart so that we might walk with you as the vine, we as the branches, in childlike dependence and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's like a river attendant my way when sorrows like sea billows roll.
though. I'm excited to be able to, to step in and preach and uh, continuing our series on spiritual warfare. And so I uh, had the Lord uh, really um, seem to use last week. A lot of you reached out and, and it resonated with you. I think it's a topic that all of us need to be more aware of, the spiritual warfare that goes on in our lives, in our world, and we see a lot of it day to day, and maybe we don't recognize it for what it is, but um, we have an enemy for sure, and uh, his name is Satan, as that video showed. So this morning, uh, I'd like just to start with prayer and then ask God to direct our time and focus our attention on him. Father, we want to come before you one more time this morning. We realize that we are in the middle of spiritual conflict. Even right now in this moment, there are going to be things that will draw us away. We have an enemy that right now wants to distract us, to, to steal our attention. We, we, we're going to be tempted to think about other things outside of this building, this room, this time, so that we will not hear what it is that you want us to hear today. And so I pray as uh, Peter so eloquently says, that we might gird up the loins of our mind, that we will engage this morning, uh, body, soul, spirit, mind, strength, that we'll, Lord, submit it all to you, that you have our undivided attention so that we can hear the message you have for us, Lord. It's, it's important. It's, it's life-changing. <clears throat> it's eternity-altering for some. And so we need help with that. We need your spirit to do that, and we just pray that you will answer that prayer for us today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our powerful Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, I don't know about you folks, but I've always hated having enemies. Um, throughout my school years, I always tried to get along with everybody. Kind of had friends from all different backgrounds and sides, and, and just always bothered me when I felt like somebody had an issue with me. Even to the point where I'd, uh, you know, if I found out somebody had an issue with me, I'd seek him out to try and find out what's going on, what happened. Surely it wasn't me, you know, uh, but we try to make amends, you know, because I just didn't like people not liking me. It's always been a kind of a people pleaser. Well, one time, I think it was like eighth grade maybe, uh, one of my female friends told me that her boyfriend was mistreating her. Well, I didn't like that, you know, because I've stuck up for my friends. I kind of always uh, did that for people. And so I made it known that I didn't care for the way this guy was treating my friend, his girlfriend. Well, apparently word got to this guy that I had a problem with him. And so then word got back to me as I sat in fourth period math class that um, he was going to meet me in the hallway outside of my classroom after fourth period. So, you know, um, I'm good with division in math class not so much in the hallway, if you know what I mean. Uh, anyway, gulp, I now apparently have an enemy. Uh, needless to say, I was nervous that this guy was going to show up outside the classroom. So I, I knew uh, where I was in the building. I knew where he was coming from. This guy was a punk, by the way. I mean that in a good Christian way. But he's a punk. Kind of had the reputation of a, you know, he'd never... Stepped down from a fight, so to speak, kind of a brawler. So what did I do? I ditched out of class early, actually. And uh, the, bell, the bell rang, and I'm like, you know, down the hallway. I didn't stick around to see what was going to happen. So I don't know how that fight went, but um, I wasn't there. Uh, last week, we mentioned, by nature of being uh, a child of God, we have a sworn enemy, the devil, right? Satan, as he's called. I don't think any of us like to have enemies, but we have one, just by nature being a child of God. You know what? And our enemy knows us. He knows what our fourth period class is and where it is, and uh, he's looking for a fight. He knows us. He knows our habits. He knows our patterns, and there are times when we will need to run. There are times when we will just need to resist the devil and he will flee from us. There are times, though, when we will need to stand and we will need to fight. The difficulty is having the wisdom to know when to do what, right, and how to respond to the attacks of Satan in our life. I just want to ask this morning, and, and I'm, this is a rhetorical question, 
But do you desire to live a successful Christian life today? Is becoming more like Jesus Christ and be bringing glory to God in your life what drives you each day? Think about that for just a moment. Is our, does our heart still ache for the people that we know that don't know the Lord? Do we still have a, a burden for, for broken families and broken marriages that are being attacked by our enemy? We've said it before, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Jesus Christ is the answer to all of life's problems. I mean, you may think that sounds cliche, and, and you know, uh, I saw a bumper sticker once uh, some sarcastic guy apparently said, Jesus is the answer, you know, well, what's the question, you know, and, and uh, I think there's this mindset that we just say, well, Jesus is the answer, we kind of blanket sweep that, and we don't really know what that looks like, but that is still true. Jesus Christ is the answer to all the world's ills right now. Even in our country, all that's going on, Jesus Christ is ultimately the real answer, the lasting answer. And I think a lot of us would agree with that, part of it. But the second part, I think, is equally true. And catch this, the church, that is you and me, we're the messengers of the message of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? Jesus is the answer. We're the means by which Jesus wants to reach people with himself and with the message of Jesus Christ. We're it. I want to be a light in my life. I want to shine the light of Jesus Christ. I imagine that's your desire as well. I want to be a light in my home to my family. I want to be a, a, a light in my community. I, I want this church, New Braunfels Bible Church, to be a light in New Braunfels, Texas, and wherever else the light may shine. And I think there are times in our country's history where the opportunity to shine the light of Jesus Christ is exceptionally favorable. And I think we're in one of those times right now, folks. We have an unprecedented, seemingly, opportunity to shine the light of Jesus Christ in our community. The present darkness that we're facing isn't going away soon. For the past few weeks, uh, I'm maybe like you. I sat and I've and I've watched and I've listened, and at one point I just finally turned it off. And I even I even uh, got off of Facebook for for several days. I just got tired of seeing the same thing over and over. Maybe you can relate to that. But I think the problem was is I just wanted it to go away. Just. Satan's at it. There we go. What I wanted in my flesh, you know, if I'm just thinking about Gary and, and what, what's good for me, I just want to live my life in peace, and I don't want to be bothered by the ills of society or the plight of the oppressed or the marginalized. That sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? I mean, those are things that I think. And I may not say that out loud all the time, you know, and, you, and, and uh, you see all that's going on, the unrest and the anger and the oppression, and, and part of me just says, man, I just want it to end. Just, you know, can we just turn it off, turn the station? Let's just move past this, right? But what I realize is, is that's uh, cruise ship Christianity, as we mentioned last week. That's not the mindset of battleship believer. And God's reminded me that I'm called to be a light in darkness. I'm called to be an agent of love and grace for Jesus Christ. And I can't really do that sitting on my couch with a remote in hand. So this morning's message is for those battleship believers that want to make a difference. If you want to be an agent of change and of grace in your life and in your family and in your church and your community for Jesus Christ, that's what this message is about this morning. This is for Christians that want to answer the call to fight the good fight of faith. 
But to do that, we need a battle plan, right? You got to have a strategy, a battle plan, because Satan certainly has a strategy. But we need one. One of the most important aspects of any battle plan is to know your foe. That's the title of the message this morning. Know your foe, bro, sis. Know your enemy. And I just want to highlight a couple specific names of Satan this morning. Because I think in the names of Satan, we understand his tactics and his strategies and his schemes. And it helps us be more aware of the way that he operates in our world and in our own lives to pull one over on us. But only when we are more aware of his schemes can we then guard against his attacks and be ready to fight. And the first name that comes to mind when you think of Satan is that he is a deceiver. And this is probably one of the most prominent names and uh, schemes that Satan pulls in all the Bible. John 8, verse 44, Jesus tells us this when he's speaking of Satan. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. He is a liar and the father of lies. That's who Satan is. He is a deceiver And he has been from the beginning of time. We all are familiar, I imagine, with his first attempt to deceive Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Genesis 3, 1 to 7 gives us the account. We won't take time to read it all, but I imagine you're familiar with it. But suffice it to say that though Satan came alongside Eve and deceived her into disobeying the clearer word of God. She knew what God had said and what God had commanded, but Satan came along and said, "Yeah, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? And she disobeyed God and ate that forbidden fruit. He convinced her to think something other than what she knew to be true. He lied to her, and she believed his lies, and it led her into sin against God. We read that account in Genesis, and I don't know about you, but there may be people that say, man, what a doofus, right? I mean... Why are you listening to a snake in the first place? I mean, really. Uh, How dumb can you be to listen? All right, man, if it were me, you know, not today, Satan. I don't know. We think we may have responded that way, but you see, spiritual deception is not an intelligence issue. It's not that Eve was, was stupid, unintelligent. It was a deception, a spiritual deception. My wife and I recently uh, watched the Netflix series on David Koresh called Waco. I don't know if you have seen that. We watched that entire series. It's the the Waco tragedy of 1993. David Koresh was this self-proclaimed Messiah of the Branch Davidians, and uh, he he led uh, over 100-some people to believe that he was their Savior, and he did some pretty uh, raunchy things, you know, and and, and marrying young girls, and, and it was just, it was bad, but uh, you would think that that group would be a bunch of nobodies or a bunch of uneducated people that were just gullible, right? I mean, if that many people can follow this guy who says he's the Messiah and they were believing all kinds of kind of weird things, but you know, you'd be wrong if you thought that. Actually, some of the main leaders within that group uh, were professionals. One was a, a seminary professor of all things. One was uh, a doctor. Uh, these were normally... Intelligent, clear-thinking people, right? And you watch this and you think, how in the world would someone that has a doctorate buy into the lies and the deception here? Well, it wasn't an intelligence issue. It never is. It's a spiritual issue. You know, the statistics show that members of false religions usually have a background in Christianity. And I imagine a lot of them may even be believers that just were led astray. But surely genuine Christians, right, real believers who know the Lord would never be dumb enough to be led astray, right? Well, they may not be led into a false religion, but, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not above deception. I think we can always be deceived fairly easily. I'm going to show you this advertisement I got in the mail, and you can tell me where it's from. Boom. Where's this from? What's it? Does this look familiar? Anybody? What's it? Can you tell by the 
by the graphics at least or nobody? Amazon? Amazon Prime, right? You guys buy things on Amazon? You, come on, you've been on quarantine. You've probably bought all kinds of stuff on Amazon Prime. This looks like an Amazon Prime mailer, doesn't it? I mean, it's got the same colors. It says, I'm, I'm Amazon. Oh, amazing. Okay. And it says, I thought it said, I hope, as soon as I got this, I was like, cool, Amazon Prime. Maybe it's a coupon. It wasn't. But uh, it looks like an Amazon Prime mailer because it has the same graphics, same you know, uh, fonts and, and whatnot. And it says same day delivery on it. And I, I opened it up thinking, cool, something from Amazon. And, uh, and I opened it up and it's a car dealership advertisement. So I bought a car. No, I didn't. But uh, I, I opened it and I was like, oh, thanks, Nissan. Anyway, but uh, it says amazing primetime event. Amazon Prime, amazing primetime, right? It looks like it's from Amazon. You know, deception is just ingrained in, in our culture. But spiritual deception, I think we can all fall for it. I know we can all fall for it. It's one of the most tried schemes of Satan since the beginning of time, and he's still honing that craft, right? There was a, a couple, middle-aged couple, I guess, um, came into the church about a year ago on a Wednesday night. Youth group had just ended, and they had come and knocked on the door, and, and you know we had let them in, and Shayla and I <clears throat> were, were talking to them over in the youth room and the couches, and you know, this kind of a well-dressed middle-aged couple, and, and they said they were just leaving work. Uh, she picked her husband up from work, and they were just heading back home, but they just wanted to stop because they just needed prayer. They just wanted someone to pray with them, which I've had happen before. And, uh, and so we listen and, and just, hey, what's going on? And she said she was pregnant and uh, that uh, she was just recently diagnosed with some kind of uh, um, illness, terminal illness of some kind. And so and they were tearful and just somber. And I mean, I just really thought, wow, you know, they seemed so sincere. They really did. And I usually can be a, a decent judge of that, but I think, you know, I just got, uh, I don't know, wrapped up in it. And, and you know how emotions and compassion kick in, and you, you're listening to this story that seems completely legit. And long story short, you know, it turns out that they um, couldn't get back into their house because they had missed the rent, and they needed like 100 bucks. Didn't ask me for it. But, you know, hey, could you just pray because, you know, we, we don't get paid until, you know. You guys are thinking, man, what a, what a doofus. <laughs> Long story short, I went down to the bank and got 100 bucks out and just brought it back and gave it to them and uh, prayed with them, hugged them, you know, exchanged phone numbers, said, hey, you know, they were going to go to the hospital, uh, and, you know, for an appointment the, the next day or two, or they have this baby coming up soon too, and, hey, call me, I'll come up and visit you guys, and. So, long story short, I never heard from them again. So, uh, texted and called and, uh, you know, wonder how that baby's doing. I don't even know if she's pregnant. But uh, I believed them. And that happens from time to time, right? Because there are people out there to scheme and to uh, try to get one over on you. And I think that just illustrates the point that um, none of us is above being scammed. I mean, think about it. Years, there's emails that you won't open, right? Because you know they're probably a scam. There are phone calls that, that you won't take because you know it's probably somebody <laughs> wanting something. Or you're not going to give your personal information out over the phone because you know there's probably a scam going on. I mean, sure, the next time a, a youngster in a <clears throat> you know, black tie and a name badge and a backpack shows up to your door, you're not going to say, oh, please, tell me more. You know, um, Where do I sign up? That may not happen. But listen, Satan knows that. He knows that about you. He knows the, the schemes that you're not going to fall for because he is a deceiver. He knows us. So his scam for you is different. He's crafty. He's an expert in deception. He's been watching and observing mankind for a long time. The Bible even tells us 
that he masquerades as an angel of light. But that's his strategy this morning in his schemes is to make us ignorant of God's will. <clears throat> Are you concerned at all about falling prey to one of the spiritual schemes of Satan? Does it concern you at all? I'm not saying are you are afraid, are you scared, you know, are you anxious about it? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying are you at least concerned? Are you at least aware that there's a potential that Satan might pull one over on you in an attempt to get you away from or be ignorant to God's will? But isn't that what God tells us to be wise of when it comes to our enemies? The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian believers, said this, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. <clears throat> Interesting concern or fear that Paul said he had for other Christians, right? I imagine that most of you aren't going to go off and join the Branch Davidians. Most aren't going to leave their families and start a, a life of crime. Most of you won't run off and become New England Patriots fans. Wait, sorry, I meant to take that out. Sorry, Patriots fans. People are leaving now. Uh, but I would imagine this, that most, if not all of us, very likely could be tempted to be led away from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Jesus Christ. Because the false teachers in the Corinthian church were selling them a bill of goods. And they were saying, hey, there's more to, to, to the abundant life of Jesus Christ than just Jesus Christ. They, they claimed if you really want to experience the best Christian life, then you need more than a relationship with Jesus Christ. It kind of sounds a lot like the, the church in Galatia when the false teachers came in, in there and, and said, yeah, uh, works, uh, grace is good, but you got to add works. And I think that's what's going on here. You know, we're all about grace and, and receiving grace and the grace of God, but, you know, it's a lot of us too. And if you really want to have the best experience, well, then it's grace and works. But there are cult, cult members and false religions and, and, and false teachers, but that's their shtick, really, isn't it? I mean, that's what they got. That's what they're selling. I don't know if you've ever had someone come to your door and offer you uh, entrance into one of their religions. And, and I, it wasn't until, I don't know, the last few years that I started thinking, what are they offering me? And so I remember one time, a couple of young guys came to my door and and I knew right away who they were, and, and I said, hey, well, if you don't mind, can I just share with you what I have in, in Jesus Christ? And I wasn't trying to be arrogant or, or boastful in any way. I was just saying, let me, let me tell you what I feel like, what I have, and then you can tell me then what you're offering. And I said, you know what? I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. All of my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. I have eternal security in Jesus. I know where I'm going when I die. I have purpose and meaning in my life because of that relationship with Jesus Christ. I have an advocate with, with the Father in Jesus. I have everything that I could ever possibly want in life because of God's grace for me. I don't ever have to earn it. I don't have to work for it. It's been given freely to me in abundance in Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Now, what exactly are you offering me? <laughs> Well, uh, well uh, we, we, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we have that too, and we're just kind of seeing, we're looking for people that don't have what you have, so we, you know, and they don't know how to respond to that. It's because they don't have, you know, they're offering, they're offering a religion. They're offering you to, uh, to join a club and to sign up and to feel good about things that you do or to feel like you're part of something, and, and we get it, right? But that's the shtick. That's how they sell that. Warren Wiersbe said, false teachers offer church members a Christian life that is superior to that described in the New Testament, a life that is an unbiblical mixture of law and grace. 
And that wasn't just going on right in the early church. It's going on still today. And that's Satan's scheme is to lure us into religion away from relationship. And we really got to be on guard against that, don't we? We think, oh, I won't fall prey to that. Really? You know, the Christian life is not all that complicated. It, it really is to know and to follow Jesus Christ. And when we know the Lord and we have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, like a real living relationship with Jesus, it transforms us from the inside out. I mean, it has to if it's really a vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus. It transforms us. His light shines through us to a dark world around us. They see us and they think, wow, they got something. You know, there's something different. I want what they have. His spirit produces supernatural love in us and through us, and it draws people in. That's the way it's supposed to work. But somehow we've been led to believe that we can do the work of the Lord without the Lord. We skip the walking with Jesus Christ part, and we go straight to the working for Christ part. Have you ever been guilty of that, you know? Like all the time. But that's exactly what Jesus had against the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2. They, <clears throat> they had great devotion. They had uh, great zeal and commitment, and they even had sound teaching, sound doctrine. But they had left their first love, which was a fervent devotion to Jesus Christ. One commentator says, though, there was much good in the Ephesian believers. The Lord was disappointed that they had left their first love, the original devotion to Christ had died down. They loved him and were serving him, but not with the same dedication and zeal they had in the beginning. And I think we all need to ask ourselves, is it possible that I may be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ? Do you ever feel tempted to just mail it in? And just kind of go through the motions. Have the pleasure problems and pandemics of our world so captivated us and our attention that our hearts are no longer fully devoted to Jesus Christ. The word translated simplicity in 2 Corinthians 11.3 means sincerity, singleness of devotion. A divided heart leads to a defiled life and is destroyed relationship. I like that. A divided heart leads to a defiled life and a destroyed relationship. So, I mean, what's Satan's end game in all this? You know, what, what's the point? Why would he lure us away and attack us and scheme us and deceive us with lies? It's to make us ignorant of God's will for our life. Because God's will is that we would live a victorious Christian life. God's will is that we'd live the abundant life that Jesus spoke of. To have victory in life and blessing through Jesus Christ. That's the abundant life. That's God's will. That's what he wills that we would experience, but yet we don't experience that a lot of times. So I think we just need to honestly ask ourselves, what lies am I believing? What deceptions am I buying into or being duped by that's drawing me away from devotion to Jesus Christ? Maybe, maybe it's a, uh, one of the common ones, like spending time in the Bible isn't necessary in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I can be a Christian, I just, and I just don't ever really have to read the Bible. Yeah, that's not necessary. Or, or praying or talking with God. You ever have this thought come into your mind, you know, praying isn't really that big a deal. I mean, I don't have to pray really to God, or, or, you know, or if I do, it doesn't really matter. If I pray for other people... I don't know that it really makes that much of a difference. Or how about this one? You know, just knowing a lot about the Bible is good enough. Man, as long as I can pass that, you know, Bible quiz online and post it on Facebook so everyone knows I got 100% on the Bible quiz, that's good, right? I have the information. Obedience is optional. 
Oh, how subtle and sneaky are the schemes of the devil. Think about this, guys. It's, it's not massive deception, right? It's not these huge lies that's going to cause us to kind of go over the cliff. It's just a small little lies that kind of erode our spiritual life from the inside out, right? Makes us discontent, makes us continually angry, always anxious, always just kind of missing out on the best because we're so caught up in listening to the little lies. That leads us to the second name of Satan, and this is the final one this morning, but he is also called a destroyer. Isn't this an uplifting message? It gets better, just hang on. But 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That word in the Greek, devour, means to cause the complete and sudden destruction of someone or something. To destroy, to ruin completely. This is Satan's objective for Christians. As a deceiver, he's trying to lure us away in our minds to think lies and to believe schemes and to fall for things. But through his, uh, as a destroyer, he just wants to ruin us all together. In a literal sense. And I think this is where the personal attacks in our physical life take place. Because let's be honest, if Satan can cause our death, that would certainly be his end goal. And if he can't do that, well then, publicly discrediting us and our testimony for the Lord through scandal or or moral failure would certainly be a close second, wouldn't it? If there's one character in the New Testament that fell victim to Satan's schemes in, in a public way, it was Peter. I think we can all relate to Peter, right? As one of the most outspoken followers of Jesus Christ, Satan had his sights set on Peter. In fact, Jesus even told Peter at one time in Luke 22, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith should not fall or fail. Jesus came up to Peter, Simon, he called him, and said, Simon, Satan, Wants to take you out, man. He wants to sift you like wheat. I mean, what, was, what did Peter say? Did it, how did he respond? Lord, you know, sift me like, what, is he making bread? Does he know I'm gluten-free? I don't know. He missed it, apparently. He didn't, he didn't get it. Well, that's a pretty serious accusation, isn't it? That, hey, Satan has demanded permission, one translation reads. He wants to sift you like wheat. Peter said, okay. And in one night, Peter succumbed to the scheme of the devil and denied that he even knew the Lord publicly, right? Do you guys remember that occasion in Scripture? Peter's out by the fire, and it says some little girl asked him, hey, weren't you one? And he's like, with cursing, denying that he knew Jesus. Hmm. Uh... And do you remember what Peter was saying just before all of this to Jesus? Lord, I'm with you. Not me, Lord. I got your back. I will go to jail for you. I'll die for you. Not me. And I think Peter was ready for a physical fight. I just don't think he was ready at all for a spiritual one. Because everyone's willing to die for Jesus until they're called on to die for Jesus, right? Right? So it's no wonder Peter was the one to exhort Christians here to be alert. This is who's writing, right? Be alert and be sober-minded. In other words, be spiritually alert. Be on guard. Have your minds under control when it comes to the conflict with Satan. Don't dismiss it. Don't minimize it. Be able and ready to recognize it because he's actively seeking to devour and bring us down. I know that's not the most uplifting thing to hear, is it? But I think we need a dose of reality in the Christian life. Peter was caught off guard. 
And he learned from that. He actually wrote a little earlier in 1 Peter, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying be mentally and spiritually alert, folks. Christians, this is written to us. Hey, engage. Don't don't sign off. Don't check out. Stay vigilant and focus on Jesus Christ, but be prepared for the attacks of your enemy. Know that they're going to come. You're not the only one that Satan just decides not to bother. And some of the most difficult times that that is hard to walk by faith are the times when we're under physical attack. From the times that maybe we're just tired, hangry. (laughs) You ever get hangry? Amen, brother. From the times that we're sick, the times that we uh, are anxious, the times that we're afraid, maybe our, our lives are threatened. Those are the times when it's really, really difficult to walk by faith and to trust God, isn't it? Job's a great example of that. We all know what was going on behind the scenes in the life of Job, right? You read the account of Job. It's interesting that uh, Satan was given permission to attack Job physically. And so Satan says, it's on. And so he took everything from Job. It's interesting that when God asked Satan where he had come from, if you remember this little exchange, as if God didn't know, but he's like, hey, Satan, where'd you come from? And this is what Job 1, 7 says, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. Does that sound familiar at all? From roaming throughout the earth. And so we know that Satan was roaming about, seeking someone to devour, and he had his sight set on Job. And so Satan took it out. He, he took his livelihood. He took all of his servants. He took all of his livestock, his, his uh, means of support. He took, he took all of his children. And then he took his own health. He left his wife for some reason. That's interesting. But anyway. But he, just, he took everything physically in Job's world. Because Satan thought that Job's faith was tied to his physical blessings and circumstances, right? And that's what he said. God, you no wonder he serves you. Look what the guy's got everything. You blessed him so much. I mean, who wouldn't love you, right? And God said, "Mm, I know Job a little better than that. So have at it. But don't take his life. But you see, Satan's been observing mankind for a long time. And he knows us. And he knows that we can be fickle people. And that our faith and our trust in God a lot of times can be tied to our circumstances and our physical well-being, right? When life is good and the blessings flow, we sing God's phrases. But when the resources dry up or the times get tough or especially when our health takes a turn for the worse... Our faith starts to fade. And when faith fades, so does the testimony for God on the earth, which is Satan's agenda. You ever been there? You ever feel really good physically, right? That stimulus check hit your bank? Hey, praise God, you know, God is so good. Things are good. But when that unexpected bill comes, or the marriage begins to crumble, or the kids begin to wander, or the diagnosis comes in, our faith mm, starts to slip a little bit. I mean, that's the pattern in my life, at least, if I'm honest. I'd like to think that I'd stand strong in the face of persecution or suffering, but I'm just not sure how well I'd hold up. I mean, I stub my toe at 2 in the morning. I'm like, Satan! No, I don't do that. But honestly, I don't know. I mean, we're so insulated, aren't we? We're kind of, we're so blessed, and it's good, and we should praise God for it. But, man, sometimes I just feel like, I don't know. 
Have you considered the destroyer maybe behind some of the physical ailments that you experience in your life right now? I'm not, I'm not saying that every time you scrape your knee, darn you, Satan, you know. But have you ever considered that maybe he is behind physical hardships? I don't think we can say he's behind everyone. But when you look at the Bible's accounts of the times when God's people physically were attacked, guess who's behind it? When Joseph was attacked, do you remember that? His brothers threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, spent all these years in prison. Could you imagine, you know, what, what our perspective might be? Man, God, you know. But you know who's behind that? Because later in life, when Joseph finally got to the end of all this, he, what did he say to his brothers? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Satan's orchestrating stuff. The Apostle Paul, he endured persecution. He endured physical abuse. He was, he was beaten up and left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was in prison. He, but he had these physical weaknesses as well, he wrote about. They plagued his life. Some scholars think that it could be anything from uh, constant temptation to chronic maladi- uh, maladies uh, such as uh, poor eyesight, some say. Maybe he had malaria, migraine headaches, epilepsy. They don't know. There's, they, dis- they disagree on that, but they, it could have been disability in speech. He had all these issues, though, in his life physically, and he struggled with it. He prayed. He actually called it a thorn in his flesh. Do you remember this? And he prayed to God three times to remove it. But here's what he said about it in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Some of you kids think your little brother is a messenger of Satan sent to torment you. I assure you he's not. But isn't that interesting? And I think what we gain from this passage is that Paul's physical affliction was a messenger of Satan, literally an angel of Satan. Satan said, I'm dispatching you to the Apostle Paul to torment him. One commentator said, as Satan was permitted by God to afflict Job, he was now being used again to afflict Paul. These are hard things to understand, aren't they? As I'm, as I'm sharing this, are, are your wheels turning and thinking, why would God allow that? Why would God give permission? Let's close in prayer. No, I'll get to that. They're hard. I, I don't know that we have, we're going to be satisfied with all the answers we have. They are hard things to understand. We wrestle with them. I hope you wrestle with them. But we have to prepare our minds for action, though. And we have to be sober and think clearly about these things. Because I think one of Satan's best schemes is to get people to distrust God. If I can get you to just not have faith and distrust God in your life because of what you see going on around you or in your life, then guess what? He's won. And he chips away at the faith. And so if he can use physical affirmities, whether directly or indirectly, to get us to blame God... You ever hear that? People blame God for things. That's his strategy. And that's to make us impatient with God's will. The first point was to make us ignorant. He doesn't want us to know what God's will is. But we do know, right? I think most of us in this room, maybe even watching, we know what God's will is. God's will for you is to know and follow Jesus. It's to be more like Jesus, to conform to the image of Jesus, to be a light so if he, if he can't make us ignorant to it, maybe he's just going to make us impatient with it. And I think if he knows that he at, attacks our finances or our families or our health, it's only a matter of time before our faith starts to crumble. The only place in the New Testament where Job is mentioned is James 5.11. But listen to what it says about, about Job. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. The endurance of Job. And so Satan's strategy with Job was, hey, let's just turn up the heat. Let's just dump it out on him, right? And let's just overwhelm him, and then he'll give up. 
I mean, it worked on Job's wife, right? If you read that account, Job's wife's like, hey, Job, you know, curse God and die, bro. I mean, how are you putting up with this? Job never did. He didn't succumb to the temptation, but he endured. And God graciously gave back to Job double everything that he lost. And as we read today, Job's life is one of the greatest testimonies of faith through suffering in in all of history, isn't it? You read Job and you're like, man, I got a good life. I can endure this. I mean, look what Job endured, which is kind of the point, I think. But as we mentioned, something that's interesting is that in each of these cases where Satan attacks someone physically or he always had to have permission. And though Satan has power to inflict harm against God's people, which I believe he can, he can't indwell us because we have Christ in us, but he certainly can inflict pain. I mean, Christians are persecuted all over the world. Who do we think is behind it? But he gets permission. God is still ultimately in control. That'll keep you awake at night, won't it? I think the question then for us as I close here this morning is, how how are you going to respond to that? How are you going to respond when you're under attack? Are you going to still trust God and his goodness? Do you have faith in the person of God, the character of God? Do you know that God is good all the time? And that anything that he allows into your life, ultimately he will turn into good? Isn't that what Romans 8 says? Do you know the Bible says that there is no temptation or testing But such is common to man. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will also give a way of escape. God always has a plan. He's good. He's not going to give you something more than you can bear through his strength and through his power. But that's the key there. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter after he told him that Satan wanted to sift him like wheat? He said, Satan asked to sift you like wheat. He demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But then Jesus said, what? But I've prayed for you. I don't know about you, but if I were Peter, (laughs) I would be like, yeah, aren't you the one that's supposed to help me? You know, I mean, if I have an issue, wouldn't that be like someone saying, hey, you know, someone's on their way over to your house to shoot you, but I've prayed for you. Oh, okay, thanks. You know, how about calling the cops? How about helping me, help out, you know, but I prayed for you. I mean, Jesus, you're the one that I'm praying to to help me, but you're praying for me. So I always thought that was a little funny. Satan's uh, wanting to kill you, but I prayed for you, so you're good. Um, Thanks. Why? Why? Why did Jesus say, Satan's asked to take you out, Peter, but uh, I prayed for you. And he prayed that your faith may not fail. Why? Because Peter needed to learn to fight his own battles with the Lord's strength, of course. It's not Peter's strength, but it's Peter's faith. Listen, I'm not going to get into a big theology lesson here, but if our theology or our our faith is just a, well, you know, God's sovereign and he just does everything and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm helpless, there's nothing really that I need to do. I'm not sure we have a good theology. And I think that's what's going on here with, with Peter. And Peter, I prayed for you. Because there's going to come a time a little bit later, the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm going to ask you to pray and to be, to be watchful. And what did Peter do? He fell. He slept. A little bit later, he denied Christ. But it, God restored him. I think Peter needed to fight. I, need, I think he needed to be on the alert. I think he needed to be sober, and he wasn't. And I don't know that he took it seriously in those moments. But listen, I can relate. I'm not trying to condemn Peter here. I'm not trying to say, man, look at Peter, you know. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's the tactic, isn't it? We've got to fight, Christians. We, we, we need to have an active faith. Let, 
and, and a theology note, God doesn't just gift faith to people. Right? I, you know, I prayed for faith and God didn't give it to me. That's not, I'm sorry, but that's not in the Bible. There's a gift of faith, spiritual gift of faith, and that's something different, but God's calling on us to trust him. It's your faith. You need to learn to trust. We need to learn to walk with God. We need to learn to trust God. And God's for us, and he will be there, and he is there, and he will help us, and he will strengthen us, and he has given us all the resources that you will ever possibly need to fight the good fight of faith, but you have to fight. You have to endure. You can't be impatient. You can't give up. Because I think there are, there are marriages that have given up. And you're not fighting for your spouse anymore. You're not fighting for your marriage anymore. Some of you have prodigal children, and you've given up. And you're not, you're not praying. There are families falling apart. The churches, communities, the Christians, we, we seem to stop fighting the good fight of faith. It's a fight. It's a battle. And so I just want to appeal to you today. you got to fight. We just can't kick back and just float through life and, que sera, sera, God is sovereign. Nothing I do is going to change anything, right? That's not true. Jesus prayed, Peter, I pray your faith won't fail, but when it does, I'll restore you. Jesus knows the outcome. God, God knows because he is all-knowing. It doesn't mean that he's dictating everything that we do. He gives us choice. Will you trust me? Will you fight the good fight of faith? Are you going to succumb to the temptation of the evil one to doubt me? To be consumed by your your world and your problems and your issues, which are legit. We all struggle with them, for sure. We all have a lot of unanswered questions, right? We're, we've been victims of abuse. We've been hurt, damaged. I think a lot of us could say that. How are we going to respond? Do I trust you, God? Are you still good? You still working in my life? You still got a plan? Yeah, he does, but we got to fight. Will you keep fighting? Father, thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to, uh, to just take a few moments of our busy week, our busy lives, consumed with the affairs of this world, and to get a glimpse into your heart and what you're doing in us. You love us, God, without question, without condition. You know our frame, you know our struggles but you've also called us to fight the good fight of faith. And so my prayer is for all of us here this morning that have struggled in our faith. We have not been praying. We have not been active in our Christian life. We have not drawn close to you. We have not disciplined our life to spend time with you and to receive all the blessings that you have offered. We have not cast our burden on you We've carried it ourselves. And so we just ask forgiveness of that, Lord. We know that you're a good God who cleanses us of all sin, and, and you'll strengthen us, give us the right perspective, help us to be wise to the strategies of Satan who wants to devour us, eliminate us, snuff out our testimony in this world, in our family. Lord, we need to be focused. We need to be vigilant. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing on that. Let's move into this week with simple-hearted devotion to Jesus Christ. Please stand with us. Let's sing this together. You are the only one I need. I bow all of me at your feet. I worship you Given me more than I could ever have wanted. I want 
you are good. For you, alone, our Father, and you alone are good. You alone are Savior, and you alone are God. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for joining us. We uh, love seeing you. Thanks for anyone that tuned in online. Next week is Father's Day. And uh, our very own uh, Clark England will be sharing, so I'm looking forward to that. But would you pray for us through this series? And I promise you, it gets more upbeat. All right, just hang in there. Because we're going to talk about uh, the weapons that God has given us to fight the fight, you know, and the spiritual armor. And we're going to talk a lot more about um, the victory we have in Jesus. We want to leave on that note. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Amen? So we have a Lord and Savior who is uh, risen, alive, coming again. We're excited we're not going to get uh, overwhelmed by, by our enemy. And so we want to leave on that note. Jesus Christ is very much uh, alive and active. And so, um, but let's just pray, and we'll dismiss you this morning. Father, thank you again for today. Help us to leave here just remembering that um, you are Lord of all. There's nothing that's going to happen in this world or in our life that uh, hasn't crossed your desk, that you aren't uh, sovereignly um, at, a part of and at work in. And so we just want to trust you, Lord, in that. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.